Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you may be in the world. My name is Sophia Arend, and I'm the Global Blockchain Business Council's Communications and Content Lead. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the Global Blockchain Business Council and Global Digital Finance's Global Leader Series. This is a weekly global town hall we host with policymakers and business leaders around the world to hear their insights into their work, the state of the blockchain and digital asset industry and current global affairs. And today we have the pleasure to be joined by Michael Casey, Chief Content Officer at Coindesk and GBBC Regional Ambassador to Australia, and GBBC, GBBC CEO and GDF Board Director Sandra Rowe for a conversation and live audience Q&A on the future of media, disinformation, the future of money and value, and his journey to Chief Content Officer at Coindesk. Just briefly before we begin, I would like to introduce Michael. As I mentioned, he is, the, he is Coindesk's Chief Content Officer. Previously, he was the CEO of Streambed Media, a company he co-founded to develop prominence data for digital content. He was also a senior advisor at MIT Media Lab's Digital Currency Initiative and a senior lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management. Prior to joining MIT, he spent 18 years at the Wall Street Journal, where his last position was as a senior columnist covering global economic affairs. He has also authored five books, including The Age of Cryptocurrency and The Truth Machine, both co-authored with Paul Vigna. Thanks so much for joining us, and we welcome your questions at any point during today's conversation. So please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Thank you, Sandra and Michael. I'll now hand things over to you to begin. Great. Well, welcome everyone. And thank you, Sophia, for the uh, great intro as always. I am super excited to have not only a media guru here with us today, media and crypto guru, I should say, but also a dear friend of the GBBC and longtime supporter uh, as our regional ambassador to Australia. Uh, Michael, kick us off with really just a little bit about People who are in the space know you, but for those who are not as familiar with your journey, how have you ended up not only in the crypto space, but also on the media side of the crypto space? Walk us through that journey. Well, first of all, Sandra, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an honor, it's a pleasure. It's always a joy to be with you guys. Um, and, and interestingly, I think it's fair to say that that journey that I've been on, uh, a big chunk of it has been with uh, with uh, folks from the GBBC because it, it dates right back to those those early days and it's it's been it's been a joy so and it's hard uh, to get from us and what a ride um, so so look my entry into this I think goes back to uh, my what I was doing before uh, actually quite some time before I moved back to New York I I spent six years of my life in Argentina um, where I was the bureau chief for Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal and we covered as many of you who know what that country is all about. It's it's impossible to live in Argentina for six years and not at some point to be covering some sort of financial crisis. At that point, it was the it, it was the aftermath of the massive financial crisis uh, in it, that sort of exploded in 2001, 2002. And it was all about just all of the mess that that country was all about. Like the, trying, trying to unravel massive amounts of debt. There was a 75% devaluation. Right. Uh, and, and there was inflation coming back, which is the way that the cycle always works. And everything was just looking like a mess. And then I came back to the US and I covered the global financial crisis. That was, I moved back to, to New York and New York and I was right in the middle of, of, of that. Even more fun, yeah. Yes, more fun. And and then, you know, in the midst of all that, I, you know, I, I took over, I was running the, something called the DJ FX Trader, which is a foreign exchange trading service that we ran out of, out of uh, New York. And I would, as part of that, would write a regular column on, on currencies. And I think like mid 2013, um, there was the Cyprus uh, blow up and Bitcoin rallied in the midst of that crisis. And I was like, what is this? And mm -hmm. wrote a fairly ordinary column about it saying, you know, it was a tulip bubble sort of thing and, and didn't know what the hell, you know, and basically be careful, you know, investors sort of column. And which I still stand by, right? Always be careful. Uh, but um, got got sort of called up by a bunch of people. Um, Jeremy Allaire from Circle, uh, Barry Silbert. Uh, at that stage, he had still hadn't founded BCG. It was first market. Guys like Raj Date, who was the interim uh, head or had been of the CFPB before uh, CB. I get that right? It's the Human Financial Protection Board. Yeah, CFPB that uh, Elizabeth Warren had founded. And I was like, what? These sort of established investors. And, and this guy who'd come from government and a bunch of other folks were there as well. Right. I'm thinking, my goodness, there's something here. And then somebody just laid out the framework for this as a way to resolve trust in, in the developing world. 
and and I just suddenly saw that all the things I'd written about, the institutional breakdown that in Argentina was, could be dealt with with a completely different way if we just change the mindset about how do we guarantee the the covenant, if you like, between you know users, people, and and their money. So the the penny dropped, the light bulb yep. went off. Yep. And uh, that was it. I started writing about it and wrote wrote. Yeah, you know, the first book with Paul, and we launched a column called Bitbeat and W with the Wall Street Journal. Eventually, I got so excited about it, I was like, "That's it! I'm I'm out of here! I'm I'm getting into this!" And ended up at MIT. So yeah, that's that's how I got into it. Then, look, bottom line, media has always been in my blood, um, and I found that it, you know, as much as it was absolutely exhilarating being up there in the 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 um, the toy store, as some people call the MIT Media Lab, with all the robots running around, it's the it's the coolest place uh, if you want it's to sort of pretty cool place. To be. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Really, very interesting stuff. Had a great time. Worked with some smart people: Simon Johnson, Gary Gensler, uh, Neha. You know Neha yeah. Nadal, who you know well. Um, and, but I was like flitting back and forth from New York, and I was I found that I was doing a lot of public speaking um, and still writing a lot. I wrote two books in that time. Um, and I just realized, look, media is what I do. Uh, somewhere along the line, CoinDesk could have wrote me into being the chairman of their advisory board. Um, and bit by bit, it was like, you know what? Why don't you come over and, and help us build this thing as, as a real project? It was extreme. I mean, not only am I thrilled to be have this opportunity to build out this product. Oh, by the way, in the middle of that, I, I launched a company, Streambed Media, which I want to talk about at some point because it's exciting. Yeah, definitely uh, going to talk about um, it. And that's still alive and kicking very well. Jenna Pilgrim is running that uh, and uh, doing a great job with it. But um, you know, there's just so, was so much going on. So it was it, it felt nice to be able to have something solid, uh, but nonetheless still exciting with a massive amount of, of growth and opportunity, and, and and not to suddenly be beholden to the speaking circuit, which suddenly, sadly, disappeared. Yeah, we're we're, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, well, first of all, you are absolutely um, the right type of person because just like every other blockchain crypto person I know, you have several different projects and initiatives going on at the exact same time. Um, and you have a passion for it, just like many, many folks in the audience and in the community do. But today we're here really to talk about um, media, its role in society. And frankly, you and I were talking about this right before we came on it's fundamentally broken across so many different parts of it. We're gonna tackle it, not from just sitting here and complaining and whining about how broken media is, but actually we're gonna talk about what are the possible solutions? What are the business models that are actually gonna work and make it viable? Because that's partially the problem. A lot of the old business models don't work anymore. Um, so Michael, you and I were together a year ago at Davos. I cannot believe it was actually a year ago. And uh, at the GBBC Blockchain Central Lounge, as we normally have every year since we started. Um, and this year, we're not there. This year, it's a fundamentally different um, period of time. Can you just tell us in the last 12 months, what have you observed um, that are some of the real pain points around media? And then obviously, you could tie that back to Coindesk and crypto. But um, just more generally, what are some of the things that you've discovered, especially in the last 12 months, that are fundamentally big problems. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's, it's, if anything, it was really a doubling down of the, of the existing problems, right? And so um, the, the existing problem is that we've sort of lost, um, we've lost our North Star about, about how do we, you know, basically ascertain truth um, and, and how, how do we arrive at a consensus uh, as a society around what's a fact and what isn't. And, and that's, that's partly because of what ultimately isn't a bad thing, right? I mean, I, I wrote a book with, uh, um, with Oliver Luckett, who I, who I met, I think, when the same time the GBBC was announced, probably pretty much at, at Necker Island. And Oliver and I wrote this book called The Social Organism. You know, and, and we have to recognize this is actually a hugely revolutionary moment where information and the capacity to broadcast, to speak to everybody is now spread across the world. Nobody, you, you don't, the barrier to entry to be a publisher has basically been reduced to zero. Yeah. Um, and that is a huge change. We compared it to the, you know, as big a moment in some respects as, as the arrival of Gutenberg's printing press to change the whole structure of how information and media is, is shared, which is where the foundation of society, right? So huge change. 
But what it meant for mainstream media who had played this kind of like, um, you know, filtering role, this sort of, you know, they established what's, what's known as the Overton window, right? The, the range of opinions that are kind of like acceptable. Right. Not too far to the left, not too far to the right, but you have this, you, know, you don't want to have your white supremacists and you don't need your sort of, you know, Marxist revolutionaries. Those guys don't get much of a say at the table. This is kind of middle ground. Now, all of a sudden, the whole thing was blown apart and everybody gets to speak, right? Right. So, so that's the sort of foundational problem. That, that's in itself not bad, right? That's a democratizing of information. The thing is, how do we figure out a society what is acceptable, what is it? What, how do we come to consensus? That's the real problem. Now, with COVID, everything has gone to that level even more because uh, what we've done is we've demonstrated that this one other barrier to entry that kind of existed for uh, the sort of establishment of a, of a dominant voice, <clears throat> which was like, office space and and, and, the, and the idea of a physical newsroom and, and all of that sort of stuff, which meant that you had still had this gravitas of being the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or whatever. Right. Well, that's gone away because we've figured out how we can do this all remotely, right? So, so now the barrier to entry is even lower if you think about not just the access points, but also that everybody can publish uh, and, and build these kind of networks. We've, we're sort of establishing different forms of organization in a, in a uh, in an online environment, which is what, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, Coase's theory of the firm, firm is all about, right? You gather communities and that's where the power comes. Now you can do that as well in this decentralized communities. So, so it's even, it's yet another level of, of you know, sort of disintermediation of mainstream media. Um, and that's, again, arguably a good thing, but it just means that Everything's changing, right? There's, this, is, this has been the year of the Substack uh, newsletter. Every, every journalist out there quitting their jobs, becoming you know self-serving, self uh, self-serving as well, but self-publishing sub Substack right. newsletter writers. The, everyone's got a podcast, right? Now there's Clubhouse. There's all of this stuff is me. Everybody's getting an even. There's all these new tools for everyone to have, have a voice. Again, a good thing, but uh, it, it just means the noise is is so much even louder than it was. Yeah. And, and clearly that's a major contributor. I would say it is the major contributor to the political confusion and the division and the, and the acrimony and, you know, and, and frankly, massive amounts of disinformation from both sides of politics that, that you know, undermine our capacity to, to, to sort of work through things out as we, as we used to. So I want to keep talking about um, a very good point you've made, the democratization effect of anyone effectively being able to be a reporter or a journalist or, um, you know, a publisher. That sounds great to be able to express your own independent thoughts. Um, but ha what happens in this world of everyone can be a quote unquote expert when they're not an expert? Um, and this is my big fundamental issue has been we've got so much chaos and noise now We've got people who have actually quite large followings, whether it's on YouTube or various podcasts, who actually, frankly, I'm going to call it, they're full of BS. And yet people are following them like a bunch of lemmings. Uh, what do we do in this world? Yeah, no, this is this is a huge issue, right? So so this is where we start to talk about the architecture of the, the business models of, of, the, of, the, of what I say are the by far the biggest problems that we have, right? When that is... The dominant platforms right the the facebook's the twitter's whatever and this is not to pass judgment on on them as institutions per se we all need them we all like you know we we you and i promoted uh this this talk on twitter on linkedin we we, we need these platforms because they are the, the gathering places that we have but the real problem is they you know i i believe they are utilities i, I believe we need to treat them as we do electricity utility there's a public good there i don't want to debate whether they you know we have free set free Free press rights and, and the censorship, you know, uh, rules should should be applied to them or whatever. That whole platform versus publisher thing is really complicated. But at the same time, they clearly do function as public forums. Now, if that were the case, if it was a true public forum, then it would be literally a cacophony, right? We would just have to go in, and this is why Clubhouse is interesting because it does feel a bit that way. You're like discovering what you want in there by your own terms, um, but it's not. It, it's it's pushed. Information is delivered to you according to an algorithm that's deliberately designed to maximize the formation of particular audiences for the interests of advertisers and, and therefore by extension, the shareholders of, the, of Facebook or of Twitter and so forth, right? So if you, there's, a, there's a classic thing that 
the journal did, uh, Wall Street Journal did on, uh, it's called Red Feed, Blue Feed. And they, 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 they looked at what you would get if you happened to be inclined towards conservative thinking as opposed to being inclined towards liberal thinking. And mm. you would be reading completely different things, right? right. And that, that's being created because they want you to be part of this like-minded echo chamber of audience, right? right. And, and then, so that's, that's now what we have. So, if you, so, so the point is, if I, what, what does that do to the incentive model for somebody who's producing information? That's like, okay, if I just create a complete lie, and then, and then the classic example, by the way, that I always go back to was a story that BuzzFeed broke um, in 2016, in the middle of the, 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 the election cycle. Um, and they'd figured out that, that, that some of the most uh, widely shared stories on Facebook ar around the election were, were complete lies, ridiculous lies. Like there was stuff like, and this was, this was all, this is going after conservatives, but the same thing could be applied to liberals. On the conservative side, it was like, you know, uh, um, you know Pope Francis uh, endorses Donald Trump. Um, there were stories like, you know, Kenya finally uncovers uh, Obama's birth certificate. Uh, just utter BS, right? And right. Um, ultimately, those things did it remarkably well. They would be outperforming any story by the New York Times or, or by the Wall Street Journal or anybody else because they were entirely tailored to land in these echo chambers where people who wanted to believe their confirmation biases were being confirmed, they yeah. just consistently retweeted and shared and shared and shared. And that was great for platform for advertisers, right? Because that's what you want. You want these like audiences who just generate feeds of content of sharing and retweet so so what was happening is this was all these stories were being produced by one little website in macedonia uh and they were making money because all those eyeballs were coming back to their site which was generating google sense so these kids kids they were teenagers were just like okay what can we make up today and what struck me at that point was like okay <laughs> we have completely destroyed media because think about the incentives here um, it, it, it is far easier and more effective to make money, to get attention to, to, in, in compliance with what the algorithm wants you to do, the Facebook algorithm, to create utter lies than it is to try to get the story right. If you're the New York Times, you, you, you make sure that there's uh, you know, a couple of journalists on the story. There is uh, an, an editor. There is an editor-in-chief. There's a whole architecture there to make sure you get the story right. There's lawyers you spend money on sending people out to get the story right. All of that is, is a wasted sunk cost relative to just outright lying, right? Which is the easiest thing in the world to do. So that is broken. That, that, is, that is about as serious a problem as you could possibly imagine because that information is how we form society. That's how we make our decisions on politics. So we've got to fix this. It is bad. <laughs> Cambridge Analytica then came along, all these other things like confirmed all these issues, uh, you know, the Russian bots, all of that is, 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 is less of a function of like, point your finger at Putin, or, or you know, Trump lies versus like, you know, extreme anti Antifa, or whatever it is that you're pick your poison in terms of the bad guys in this whole process. The real problem is that the media systems incentive model is, 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 is essentially rewarding these kinds of uh, these kinds of activities. So we need to fix this in some way. You are spot on about the fact that these infrastructure platforms, whatever you want, whichever platform is your you know chosen one, are actually critical to everything we're doing here because we're all on the various platforms. And without guardrails, we are seeing exactly what you're saying. So if we are incentivized by clicks and anyone can lie, and basically put stuff out there. And then we start creating these vortexes of just absolute BS and, 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 and actually quite potentially dangerous um, ideas around, sorry, not ideas, but dangerous uh, non-facts or not facts, um, incorrect information, what needs to happen? So here's my question to you. In a perfect world where you could wave a magic wand, do we change the uh, click system is it getting regulators in? Does it need to be regulated at some level? Everything else is regulated, let's face it, in the world. Um, why are these techs not regulated? That's a question. Mm -hmm. uh, do these algos need to be open? Um, do, uh, do, you know, does it actually need to be that the algorithms need to be evaluated by some sort of oversight committee? Um, what are some of your thoughts around this? How do we 
fix this? What are some of yeah, the it's, it's, it's so it's all it's kind of all of the above. Uh, in fact, I would I would pick, I would break all three down and and talk about you know what the options are, what the problems are, and everything else, right? Yeah. So let's let's start with clicks because clicks is actually about data, uh, um, you know, and so you know that, I mean clickbait is one thing, right? But clickbait is is <clears throat> is incentivized. Uh, is, is what you do because you incentivize to, to gather data that you then sell to advertisers, right? So I want to get as many eyeballs on my thing, right? So that's the data. The data is like, you know, um, how, how many followers do I have? How many stories or, you know, how, how, many, how many likes, how many eyeballs, you know, what, what, is, what are the views basically? Um, and, and, and the problem here is that that data is controlled by these platforms. And so you're now living in a walled garden and their algorithm to the third point you make is telling us a, where the traffic goes, and therefore the data is subject to the algorithm. And then B, I can't amalgamate that data with data that I might want to get from LinkedIn versus Twitter. It's, it's all siloed. So, okay. so what happens is that um, data is now a function, is, it's, it's basically segmented and, I, and it's, it's all a direct function of the account. So I, I'm, I, I talk, you know, so influencers and the like, you know, who make money from telling you how many uh, uh, followers they have. They, 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 they tend to gravitate to one place. I'm on Instagram or I'm on TikTok or whatever. Right. And, and that's where they, and all of their, um, you know, identity and power is captured by and controlled by that platform's data feed. What we did at Streambed was to try to, you know, think about how do we build an architecture that actually takes that data and allows us to sort of, to, to amalgamate it, to collaborate it, to, to, to actually change the conversation away from, how's my account doing at this place to then how is the content doing? So if I post a video to multiple sites, I can start to create a data field that exists separate to that. And this, by the way, is where blockchain becomes really important, right? I, I don't think blockchain is a magic solution to all of this, but I really think that we need, the data is a currency. It, it absolutely is. And it's not obviously very different from a typical currency. We call it the new oil, we call it whatever it is. It is nonetheless, this hugely important commodity within the digital media ecosystem. And we've got to figure out how we trade that stuff, right? In some respects, these platforms action act like Wall Street uh, banks. And, and you would know this well, because you've been in that space for a long time yourself. But like, think of how banks used to sit in the middle of what a bond deal was. And you're a buyer and you're like, all right, I want to buy, you know, uh, um, a AAA bond, a 30 year AT&T. AT &T. And they're like, all right, well, I'll tell you the price. And then they go into the market and they find a seller and, and neither the seller or the buyer knows what that, what the value is. The wall street guy sits in the middle with all the information and they broker the price, right? So information is power. It's the same thing with these platforms. Think of how Amazon, people don't understand Amazon. They think Amazon's an open, open field. Uh, anything goes kind of uh, e-marketplace. They are constantly trading buyers and sellers up against it with the data that they control and dictating that flow because the algorithm tells you what you're going to look at. So there's this huge, hugely powerful control of the most important commodity in the world right now, data in the hands of about four or five things. So we've got to break down data. And then that allows us to think about as media producers, okay, where can I start to talk directly to my audience as a whole, rather than to these fragmented things? And can I now start to negotiate on my behalf with advertisers and sponsors and others who pay for this on the basis of my collective data, rather than that, that is, everything has to be dealt through the platforms, right? So. So this is about sort of trying to create a marketplace that actually empowers everybody, sellers, you know, the, 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 sorry, the advertisers, the uh, as well as the publishers, as well as the creators. Um, anyway, that's that's the sort of the data part of it. The algorithm, yes, is a critical thing. It's like if you have that much power, and this is where the regulation part maybe comes in as well. Really, should should, should at least the very bottom line is I should know what's going to happen to my story where you're gonna put it, who's gonna see it, right? That's, that's where the challenge, because of that data dominance, I now at least have to know what the algorithm's doing. And, and so the secret algorithm is a key part of this. This was a, key, a big part of what we talked about in the social organism. Um, we need to break, break up those algorithms. Um, and, you know, and then, yeah, I, I do think that at some point, there's gonna to have to be a conversation about at what point do you, do you gain so much network effect that you're essentially a utility? And, and, and the one of the things that, we, again, social circleism, we talked about this, I think what's really interesting about this moment, if you think about what, 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 
the traditional way of thinking about a media organization is you've got the content and then you've got the distribution, right? Traditionally, it used to be the content was like what the journalists wrote, what the, what the producers wrote. The distribution was all physical hardware. It was, you know, uh, uh, your, your broadcast tower, if you're a TV, sorry, or it's your, your, you know, your printing presses or your delivery trucks, if you're a newspaper, right? So, and that's where barrier to entry history came really interesting because that was very expensive to cost all that, to, to build up that, that stuff. Now, what is our distribution network? It is, it is collections of human beings. It's, it's, it's connections. This is also why Streambed is now looking at like how we build across these platforms to figure out how do we build these, these essentially distribution networks, which is like my followerships, my friends, my connections, everything else. That is the network. And that's really, that's a huge change because now what literally is dictating distributive, distributive power, right? That, that capacity to reach audience, which is the, the measure of power in media is not your access to physical hardware, but it's your capacity to manage emotions. Like if I inspire you in some way or get you excited or get you angry or, or whatever it is, right? And, you, and, and we can just talk about hate speech and everything else that flows through the system. How, what does it do? It drives dopamine releases. That's what builds networks. So we've got this emotional component to this and, 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 and the biggest platforms are, are enabling all of that, right? So, so we have to look at this from, from the perspective of, okay, there's a network effect there and these are distribution systems. How do we regulate that? What can we possibly do that actually doesn't censor, right? But at yeah. least looks to distributive power and says, we need to moderate that somewhere in some way that it is, it is you're not using it in, in, a, uh, in a nefarious way exploiting that network effect that you have. And, and then there's a lot of interesting things that I think you could do with both regulation and um, potentially some, some sort of proof of, uh, proof of bot sort of concepts that I think borrow a little bit from blockchain thinking. Yeah, no, look, I think you've said a number of very powerful things in, in just a few minutes. Um, I, I think I would just wanna highlight uh, your you know, a reference to what's going on with data as value, we need to all wake up because data absolutely has value and we need better marketplaces for how we value that data and how we trade that data. I'll give a very simple recent example. And, and by the way, for all the folks who are putting in questions, I'm so delighted. We will get to your questions as, as quickly as we can, but I do just wanna raise this point about marketplaces and how we create value because, or sorry, how do we more efficiently create now data as value and then trade that around? Because I think it's really important and blockchain and crypto has a role to play in that, a very important one, I think. Um, Bernie. Bernie Sanders, his meme, his photo has gone crazy. Everyone's yeah, doing different things. To it. You know what made me a little bit sad? Yeah. If we had a better, more efficient way for Bernie to control that it is his photo, really. I mean, it's the photographer took it, but at the end of the day, it's he's the subject of that photo. Instead of him putting some that photo on a t sweatshirt and selling out and making a little bit of money and then he donated to a wheel, you know, meal on wheels in Vermont, that's nice. But he could have actually raised millions, if not tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions off of that, if there were an efficient way for him to actually harness the fact that everyone was sending it around. We don't have that mechanism. So if you produce something, Michael, that goes viral, um, it's great. You'll get notoriety, but what will actually get monetized? Oh, well, guess what? The big platforms will probably monetize that, or the influencers who are bigger than you will monetize that. Um, and, it, and it's a very unfair system right now. And I think what we're talking about is how do we start creating um, networks, uh, infrastructure that allows for all of us to benefit when we create unique content that is good and that is you know, um, shared around. How do we actually monetize that? Because in the future world, um, the nine to five job that you work for 50 years, that's gone. Everyone's gonna have a side hustle if they don't already have one. Um, and so, you know, um, there's a lot there that we need to think about. And I think regulation, unfortunately, is also guardrails um, need to come in. And I'm going to make one more point here because it's not so devastating as people think. It does not take away from people's First Amendment rights or whatever to have regulation. Everything else is regulated. Healthcare is regulated. Financial services related. Pretty much everything you can think of is regulated. There is an, a, a reason to regulate tech now. Tech is uh, data. 
It's data management, it's data power, it's data as money, and therefore regulation actually does need to come into play. It has not worked. It's running rampant and wild west now. It's actually hurting society. So, so, so yeah. I'm gonna make a couple of points on that because I think it's really important that we're very clear about what we mean by it, right? So, so like censorship is really problematic and we, and we need, to, and I, you know, it's, it, you know I, I, I think that the way that Twitter and Facebook and, and, and Amazon Web Services, when they shut down Parler on that, we're, we're actually just abiding by their contractual obligations as far as the terms and services by which you use it. And they are private companies and therefore they, they don't have, they're not bound by First Amendment rules. And so this was all just fine within those contracts, right? The, the, but there's still this huge question about power because it's kind of like, it is a public forum and should they or should they not have the capacity to you know, basically mute voices in this conversation. And that is a ball of wax that I don't necessarily want to get into, but it is important. <clears throat> when we think about regulation, we distinguish between sort of censorship regulation, which is where we get this First Amendment challenges lying into it, right. and, 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 and like power over data and, yeah. and distribution and, and what it is that you are obliged to do in terms of, can you make money from creating distorted algorithms when you are, you know, a vital public platform for the sake of, of information. I mean, you know, essentially like, you know, Twitter is used by the way in disasters. And I'd say, and it's actually a lot of, a lot of these things are a, a lot better than it previously was. These are useful platforms, but we use it to, to alert people to the biggest, you know, when there's a, you know, an Amber Alert or whatever, this stuff was pushed out of a social media and it has an impact. Should those so systems be subject to an algorithm that's designed for, profiting off, you know, advertising. You know, there's, there's this huge questions around that structure that I think you need to be, when we think about regulation, we need to think about. <clears throat> the other thing is, and this is where, you know, we, we, we need to understand and why, why blockchain starts to become an interesting framework for this. Um, you know, as an aside, I haven't even mentioned Coindesk yet. I need to, <laughs> I need to mention my employer, but um, our executive editor, Mark Hochstein, he probably, probably gets sick of me saying this, but I will use it over and over again because I love it. Um, says uh, blockchain is not the answer to everything, but it asks the right questions. And, and, and the question that I think that it's asking, telling us to ask about regulation of media is the recognition that these platforms are global, that this is a global conversation and, and everybody is engaged and this is coming from anywhere. And, and, and the identity of who you're talking with is somebody you don't even know, right? bots like look at the work that Graphica does about how many bots are driving the, the conversation on Twitter and they are who knows where they are they're hosted in some place and we could say Russia that's too easy it could be anywhere right, right. Um, that is a very different environment for regulation because who regulates that and how and, and what blockchain gets us to think about is okay um, you know what do we do about it what do we do about regulating a, a sphere where you don't know the identities of the participants and it is outside, literally, when, when this digital community is outside the boundaries of traditional law. So, you know, it, yes, maybe it's an international legal solution, but, you know, how do you comply with that? Um, there has to be a way to think about governance of this space that is inherently caught up with the principles behind which a blockchain is built, right? That there is a mechanism for consensus, you know, I'm not going to get into a debate whether it's either private or permissionless or whatever, and whether or not you could even scale this thing bigger because it's expensive to run public blockchains, whatever. It is nonetheless a framework to think about um, how do you intersect traditional law <clears throat> with uh, a, a, you know, a mechanism for, for, for regulating and managing this distribution of power across the system in the interest of the whole. Right. And, and so, so, you know, we need to make sure that that regulatory conversation is, is also caught up with how we think about the governance of the next, of, of basically Web 3.0, right? We're going into a right. Web 3.0 era where blockchain's a, a big part of that. How is that going to be governed? Well, that's going to be a key aspect of how we regulate uh, these, these media platforms in the future. Right. And, and, and that's a very important point. And to build on that, um, what are your thoughts around some people saying that actually what we need is public private partnership models to really affect, um, you know, proper oversight of web 3.0 and in particular, let's say a new media oversight group um, that you can't just have government government shouldn't be the ones dictating um, how this is done. It actually should be public and private. Do you think that could work? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think the way to think about this is um, what do we learn from the governance of the internet uh, prior to the arrival of blockchain? Um, and, in, and in some respects, prior to the arrival of, of what we, we call internet 2.0 or web 2.0, right? So the internet's governance clearly wasn't perfect because it, it, it allowed for, we didn't foresee the emergence of these <clears throat> hugely powerful internet companies becoming essentially new gatekeepers, right? But, but the underlying architecture of things like domain uh, registrations and you know, the, the rules by which you know, data is shared across multiple different nodes in this network has been in place and it's not perfect, but ultimately it was a multi-stakeholder model, right? So, so governments had a say in certain parts of it, but there was no way that you could govern it from a government perspective. You had to have all these different stakeholders who essentially came to, agree, came to an agreement about how the real estate or, of, of what the internet was gonna be would be, would be brokered. And um, so ICANN and the IETF and these things were built around some of these models and they need to be fixed, but they're nonetheless a great framework for it. So some of the work that's coming out of the, the World Economic Forum, by the way, underway this week, and you know, uh, you know, your, your friend and mine, Sheila Warren and I have a, from the World Economic Forum, have a podcast in which we've talked about some of this stuff and we'll continue to do some. Sure, by the way, this week's episode, which we're gonna focus on Davos, the Davos agenda, right. uh, it'll be out Friday. We'll also discuss some of this stuff. That, that governance framework is, um, you know, it, it, it now needs to be taken to the, to the 3.0 level, right? And, and so thinking about how we govern things like smart contracts, because at some point they have to, these contracts have to intersect with the real world of law, but, but you can't like every time there's a dispute over a smart contract and the algorithm that's behind that, by the way, an AI evolving probably machine learned algorithm, which is never the same. It's always changing. It's really getting complicated. Um, you know, d dispute over that. If it, it's all going to land, where's it going to go? Is it all going to be land into a US court, even if it's a, a, a battle between somebody between in Serbia and another person in, in Botswana? Uh, mm -hmm. or, or is there some other arbitration model, which is where, again, some of that early internet thinking was all about that, that exists outside of it? And can you automate that, right? Are there, are there, are there uh, are there blockchain-based governance models with tokens and the like that allow people to, to do these things? I'm not suggesting I have any of the answers, but it, it's, there's a lot of people, much bigger brains than mine, thinking hard about this intersection between the real world law layer and yeah. the internet governance thing. And many of the ideas are drawing upon what essentially, you know, a blockchain, the most important blockchain, Bitcoin, uh, succeeded in doing, which was to say governing a system without there being any particular party in charge. Right? It gives us a framework to think about these things. Absolutely. And I'm going to go to questions now just because there's a whole slew of them. And um, I want to thank uh, Michael Novak. He's got a couple here. Uh, Michael, we know well from um, uh, as a regular attendee. So thank you, Michael. He's asked a couple of questions related to how we could actually solve for some of the um, disinformation problems. What about, uh, do we need a distributed way to verify credentials? Um, what about ratings? Michael, do you want to talk a little bit about some of those um, points that, or questions that uh, yeah. Michael raised? Yeah, I think that, you know, but he's, he's, Michael's gone straight to one of the key points here, which is, which is identity. So he talked about credentials and the credentials is, an, is essentially an identity, identity concept. And, and that's sort of at the heart of this uh, because you know, Bitcoin was created with the idea that, you, that, that, that your identity would not be the defining determinant of whether or not you had access to the system. It, it's deliberately designed around pseudonymity. Now, of course, that's not complete anonymity. We know that. Nonetheless, it is, uh, it's a system that says we can govern this without, without knowing who you are. Um, now, uh, the internet is like the problem that Satoshi was trying to solve um, specifically for money um, is essentially the problem that we face on the internet around information, right? So, so you know, it was very interesting when, uh, <laughs> uh, when, when all of those QAnon sites were shut down um, uh, in, in, after Trump was shut down and everything else. And you had a lot of people for whom you know, they were their kind of subject, right? That would would be the sort of thing that a QAnon follower would go to. 
you know, I did see a number of Fox um, people on Twitter saying, hey, why Twitter's getting rid of all of my followers? Where have they all gone? Well, the right. fact is, is you had a lot of these sort of, uh, you know, QNN, QAnon type figures, but also a lot of bots, right? So that, so they have these huge numbers of bots that get built on top of, and, and again, it happens on both sides. I, I just, it's, it seems somewhat prevalent on the right, but it's just, there is this um, capacity for these, the, to absolutely inflate uh, the, the, the machine of followership and, and, and distribution and spread precisely because we don't know who you are. And so you come in and I'm Sandra, Sandra Row 1, Sandra Row 2, Sandra Row 3, and there's like, oh, yes. it, it, there probably are a bunch of them out there, right? <laughs> oh, you and I both had the same problem with, uh, per, per, uh, what do you call it, identity impersonation, Absolutely. right? Um, and that's a prolific issue as well. It's prolific, right? But the thing is like, the reason, the reason why it matters is because I can now duplicate in some way without knowing, you know, this, this message, which is what you know Bitcoin's problem was, how you know the double spend problem, right? This is this is essentially similar idea. We've so we've got to figure this out now. But then, do you want to use you know uh, the heavy uh, cudgel of identity management as the way to manage speech? Um, you know, what are we going to do about all of those you know Hong Kong activists and uh, right. you know, anybody who who wants to use this as a mechanism to get important important stuff out? So it, it's going to have to be some sort of mediated version here. Like, you know, I think it's, I, I think there's potential solutions around um, what, what proof of work was built to be in its initial form. So this is, you know, Adam Back's um, hash cash idea. And what that, what, you know, so what it was, was like, it's going to put a charge on you if you're going to spam. So the idea was you can send out you know, one email, and I'm going to charge you a Satoshi for that, a tiny little little amount of money. And you're not going to care because it's a tiny amount. But if you're going to send a million emails, it exponentially gets more and more expensive as you go on. So it just becomes absolutely not worth it to spam people. And, and it was important because it was a mechanism to actually impose through, mm -hmm. this was not money. It was, the, the point was electricity cost, right? You would have to do, a, do this hashing algorithm. The more emails you wanted to send and that would incur a cost on your on your resources and that's how why you why you would be constrained and, and i think there's something really interesting in that around the idea of bot networks yeah um, because it's very easy for an algorithm to figure out whether this is a bot network it's not it, 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 it that's there's all sorts of patterns that show that what it is and so you could sort of have this position that would say look you're allowed to build a bot network you know it, it, it's not to say it's not but it's going to cost you like if you're going to if you're going to take advantage of this privilege of not being able to identify yourself mm -hmm. and you're going to do that by multiplying these fake identities of yourself, right? we can impose a cost on that and we can do it. So it gets rapidly more and more expensive. So, so I, I, there's those sorts of things I think that need to come in so that we don't, you know, constrain the freedom that comes and the important freedoms that come with, you know, privacy. Yeah. Like the minute we put our names out there, we're just, that's it. Our, our data is gone and attached to it. Um, but, but also at the same time creates, you know, a, a, a cost and reward structure to incline people towards being more honest. Absolutely. And, and I agree with you. We've got to be very careful about not using a blunt tool like heavy handed regulation that will kill innovations that are happening today. Because frankly, there's a lot of cool, amazing things uh, being worked on and we wanna make sure that we nurture that. But let me ask you a question, Michael. Are you familiar with any groups out there doing work around what do the numbers look like? Like how many bot farms are there? How many machines are we talking about? What are the numbers around the amount of crap that we're seeing? Excuse my language. I don't know. If I'm um, I, I don't know the numbers, but I think that, that if you look at what like Graphica is based in New York, I think it's spelled with a K, G -F -M. I hope I'm getting that right. But if not, try to see GFA. P H I K A. Um, they do these incredible maps of when you know a story comes out about uh, such and such, and they're able to see where these bots come into play, whether it's Iranian bots or Russian bots or you know, you know, uh, Venezuelan bots. Um, and so there's a lot of state-run actors in this space as well. Uh, there's obviously a lot of business run. There's all those clickbait farms that you see, you know, right. up in the places like the Philippines and. 
it's I, I think it don't quote me on this, but I, I, I think that it's overwhelmingly the case that the vast amount of traffic through social media, far more than otherwise, is bots. This is not this is not actual humans. Oh. So uh, to, to Graphica, look at their stuff. It's it's absolutely mind blowing and, and quite terrifying. Um, you know, and some of that bot behavior might actually might I'm going to put might might be benign, right? It might be that this is just a machine for I don't know. There's some there's some ways you could imagine a bot being just an effective distribution mechanism, but if it is, it, it's so much of it is about disinformation, and and, and so um, yeah, there's there's this yeah there's this machinery that's pretty pretty uh, pretty horrid. Um, yeah, can, we, can we grab one of the sorry, can we just grab one of the questions there because I do want to talk a little bit about what Coindesk is doing. And so there's a yeah, somebody, anonymous tip you talk about what's our view on how traditional media covers blockchain and, and crypto. Yeah. Uh, and, and I suppose one way to talk about this is say that what we're doing versus what uh, uh, what others do. Um, you know, I, I left I left uh, the Wall Street Journal because I was frustrated by uh, the instincts of mainstream media towards this space. Um, and and I think it's because um, you know, as a society, we still haven't been able to uh, use the old analogies to describe what crypto is. So we had Jill Carlson on our show the other day in our podcast, uh, Sheila and I, and, and Jill Jill was talking about that whole parable of the the blind pe- the, the blind people who discovered an elephant. Like they, they hold one in, they don't know what it is. So we don't know how to describe what what Bitcoin is because we use the language of the past. And, and as a result, I think we end up with these sort of really broken narratives, right? Oh, it's a tool for illicit finance. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's, you know, is it a currency? I don't know. Is it a commodity? I don't know. Is it a, is it, is it, is it something else, right? Is it, is it a, is it a network governance system? Um, all of these things is possibly true, but we, we use all this language of the past to describe it. And as a result, we build regulation and everything else. So mainstream media, I think, fails to grasp what's going on because they don't start from the first principles of what Satoshi and others were trying to create. And as a result, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, I think it's getting better. Like the, the, the conversation has got more and more sophisticated, but the instinct, and this is also, by the way, you know, gets back to what we're talking about, about clickbait and everything else, right? It's much easier to say, to write stories about, you know, hacks and, and uh, you know, ransomware and bad guys and all that sort of stuff. And not, not like writing about, <clears throat> the sheer complexity of say the open source network of developers working on Bitcoin and how they actually govern BIPs and upgrades and that really complex process of these incredibly smart people working in a decentralized environment are coming together to figure out how to improve the security of this system. That's really hard to get your head around because it's much easier to call up the CEO of such and such a company and say, fix this, how do you fix it? And, and, and our heads don't, it's, we don't understand networks. Just think about how difficult it has been for people to understand the exponential impact of how viruses spread during this pandemic. They right. we think linearly, we get surprised when it goes from one to 10 to a hundred to a thousand to a million in, in five days, right? And, and um, they don't, it's hard to understand networks, right? So, uh, you know, people need to start thinking about that. Understand open source network effects and how these things happen. And then you can start to think about what, blockchains are both trying to solve and also why it's interesting. Uh, I, I think this is the, by far the most interesting story in finance you could possibly ever be writing about. Um, this is about the transformation of it, right? This is getting away from a system that's been in place since the Medici of the late 14th century, where banks are the intermediaries of the system. It's a system that's thinking about what is the scarce base fundamental source of value upon which we are going to build uh, a, a sort of a, a social backbone, if you like, for a digital world that replaces the one we've had for 7,000 years in the analog world, which is gold, right? So this is huge. This is the biggest story. This is why I'm thrilled to be you know, leading the drive at Coindesk because that's what we're writing about, the biggest story in finance. And yet mainstream media treats it like a little, it's nothing like all the tech stories we've ever had. It's not just the invention of the segue or, or you know the arrival of, of even social media these things were big and they were very important but this is about transforming not only money but the system by which we govern value transfer in in society so i want people to see that and when they do i think then they start to go oh i'm going to write about this but mainstream media still doesn't get it for the most part um so i have a problem with that right but coindesk is 
fabulously well placed. We've got smart people who've been in this for ages. And I think we are probably, you know, obviously biased, but I think more than any other uh, um, crypto media outlet that we're also able to transcend that world and write for that, what we call the discovery audience, the folks who are coming to the space and just learning about it. Because the real art to this is how do you take something as complicated as this and not just write for the folks who understand that complication, because then you're just stuck in a little siloed trade right. mag type world, but right. write for everybody so that they get to understand it. How do you draw analogies? How do you draw consistency? All those sorts of things. So we're working on that. We're trying to make, you know, this, we've, we've got all sorts of exciting things happening precisely because I think it's important to bridge that, that divide between, you know, the stakeholders who understand it, who get it and the huge, still large number of people who just don't get it. Um, that, that's a key part of our mission. And one, one last thing I'll just say as well, I think is distinctly different as we were talking about before. Um, <clears throat> We, we, there's different policies in a crypto media place, right? So we have pseudonymous sources. We, you don't have to name the source. It's okay to, we have a, we have a, a columnist who writes for us called Hasu. We don't know who he is, but, but, but because we think there's a different means of ascertaining the reliability of their information, the, the reputation that they have that's built up around that pseudonymous identifier, we think you can start to interact with that and build it and, and, and rely on it. So anyway, kind of answers the question takes us off on a different tangent as well but hopefully that's that's helpful well let's face it as much as um we want mainstream media to report properly if it weren't for the fact that they're kind of bumbling it for the most part coindesk wouldn't exist and a lot of other companies wouldn't exist so frankly it's creating opportunity and um you know we appreciate the role that coindesk plays as the translator to the, the larger audience aka the rest of the world um but let me shift a little bit because there's a question here around journalism and high quality journalism in the traditional sense. Um, it's taken a beating. A lot of these traditional newspapers are just not, you know, they've, they've had their heyday. How do we help and how do we create a, a, an incentive mechanism for the reporters out there who are reporting on really hard hitting, like important topics, you know, maybe they're individuals. Are we going to see a renaissance where maybe we can support a whole bunch of like, you know, new crop of young, you know, vibrant, hard hitting muckraker type journalists out there who really are getting into the weeds of real issues that affect us today? Um, how do we go about doing that? Yeah, like it's a huge question, right? So, so. I mean, I think it's fair to say in, in um, recent times that the, the biggest media organizations have had something of a revival. They've, they've, they've stopped the rot, if, you, if it were, okay. partly because the subscriber model has suddenly come back, right? So the New York Times, Washington Post, um, you know, so many sites now you go to, you can subscribe to, and if it's, if it's priced at the right level, you get in there. But that's still a barrier to entry, right? That still means that it's just the Bloombergs and the Washington Post and the you know, Wall Street Journals and, and, and the like who get to control the conversation. Right. Um, and, and by the way, who get to control the conversation and, or at least let's, let's put it this way, who get to be publishing uh, and getting reach, but also do the right thing, right? Which is to say, have an editorial newsroom, they get the facts right, they do that. And this is because I, I believe in traditional media, I absolutely do. Um, you need all this infrastructure to get the story right. It's very, very expensive. Um, so the luxury of having that and, uh, and paying for it is now enabled if you have a big enough audience because the subscription model is starting to work. So I think there's a, on that level, but there's this whole middle range, right? There's everywhere, everything else that like, you know, we want a, a, a broad array of voices. Um, and, and I think that there's some interesting ideas around like what's happening with Substack, what's happening with um, Clubhouse, what's happening with podcasts, because there's that, those feeds are independent of the platforms and they are not censorable. And they are, um, there's, a, there's a certain amount of autonomy that comes in that where the power is being given really to the creator, the publisher, the, the person who's speaking, the person who's writing, whatever. Um, but again, how do you then uh, build enough of an audience to also then pay for the infrastructure that need, that's needed to get this right. So I, I actually think that like one of the areas that we need to think about is local media, right? Local, local journalism has suffered enormously in this, in this downturn of media for the last secular trend for the last 20 years. And it's meant by the way that we've really, uh, our most vulnerable places for political discourse are actually at the local level. So 
<clears throat> a lot of the Black Lives Matter stuff, all of that stuff is extremely exacerbated by the failure of, of, of local journalism. But local journal, the failure of local journalism is also the failure of local communities, which is to say all of the companies and businesses that advertise and that rely on that trusted mechanism for a community to develop a voice. So I'm really interested to think about how we might find alliances between say, all of the companies in a town that want to advertise for a certain thing. And these new business models like Substack that would bring alliances and networks, distributed networks, if you like, of independent journalists together <clears throat> to collectively fund them with the you know, legal resources or the distribution resources, the marketing resources, whatever they want. But they, they form these networks of things like, you know, net, news, a, a newsletter network or something like that, right? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think we need to break open the model uh, and, 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 and just recognize that media and, and, and reliable media is absolutely vital to everybody, right? We all, you know, everybody who reads a story about their company said, or their token, by the way, my God, that the token tribes who get upset with us because we said the wrong thing about XRP or, or Ether or Bitcoin for that matter, uh, because, you know, their, their truth is this truth, right? Um, everyone does that. Every, everybody instinctively thinks they're being, and this is the, the difficulty of journalism. Everyone thinks you're, you're a crook and you, because they, they, they've got their version of the truth, right? Um, it's just the way, that, way it is. But if we can step apart from that and say, okay, despite the fact that you all want the best story written about you, we have a collective interest in every one of our companies being written about in a way that we think is handled by the most objective system of all then we can start to sort of fund these systems, pay for them, and, and collectively uh, revitalize communities and discourse around, around you know, vibrant new forms of journalism that are not subject to these sort of flawed incentives that are currently driving the model. Yeah, no, I, and you make um, excellent points there, Michael. And frankly, I'd like to see at the local level almost a distributed network of almost a PBS-like um, structure that would be public-private supported. Yeah, um, yeah so, the, PBS, the, the whole PBS Patreon, the idea of, of donation, that's a really interesting model that's starting to emerge. I mean, it's been around for a long time with PBS, but people are now, yeah, talking about Patreon and these things, saying maybe PBS actually is the answer to journalism, right? Um, I'd like to see a distributed network of kind of a next generation PBS, right? Use the latest tech, mm. make overhead really cheap, but then make sure that it's distributed across all local towns and communities that want access to it and let them build on it. Um, I think that could be pretty interesting. If there are any entrepreneurs out there who are interested in the media space working on um, these things, yeah. let us know because frankly, this is an opportunity. Um, it's also about making money and, and, and creating a fairer society. So there's a way to kind of do both good things that we need. These are critical problems. Michael, um, I have to say we have a lot more questions, but we are up on our time. It's been an incredible hour. Frankly, we've just blown through the hour, which is what I expected, but you've made some incredibly important points. I'm gonna give you the last 30 seconds for anything else you'd like to say to wrap up. Uh, look, just, <clears throat> Yeah, tr trust that journalists are trying to do the right thing, right? For the most part, right? I mean, real journalists. I obviously lots of crooked journalists out there. It, it, it try, try not to uh, have your assessment of the, of the work they're doing uh, skewed by, by the self-interest that goes with the way you want to see the story. Um, it, it's a tough job and it's a tougher job than ever, particularly writing crypto journalism because we get bombarded with stuff. But, um, you know, wouldn't do it if we don't love it. It's an, it's an, it's an exciting uh, and fascinating field to be, to be writing about. So read us, coindesk.com. Check out StreamBet as well, by the way. Listen to my podcast, Money Reimagined. Weekly newsletter, also called Money Reimagined. Sheila Warren, my podcast partner. That's my, that's my plug, my shill at the end there. Thanks for letting Absolutely. me do it, Sandra. And for any of those, uh, Michael is a online personality uh so make sure you follow him and uh reach out to him if you have any brilliant ideas to help solve some of these critical problems back over to sophia thank you michael thanks for having me sandra bye thanks so much michael and sandra um we will share a recording of this webinar for those who weren't able to join us live and also michael we will share the links to coindesk extreme bed um, as well as your podcast and newsletter thanks so much to both of you and thanks so much for everyone who tuned in and for your insightful questions uh, we look forward to having you back next week on February 2nd for a Global Leader Series with Guillaume Deschaux from Consensus. Thanks everyone, have a great rest of your day. Bye.